Um, well, thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you about dragonflies. Um, certainly a big part of what we do is, is the other E is evolution, but whenever we're going to the field to collect the insects that we need for our phylogenies, um, that really gives us an opportunity to make observations um, and look at species interaction and competition, which is a really, you know, the big aspects that kind of drive um, the evolutionary questions that we have for dragonflies and damselflies, termites and cockroaches. Um, largely what we focus on are making phylogenies um, so that we can ask questions about how insect groups are related to each other and the age and timing of insect groups. But we, we use these phylogenies, and what I'm gonna to talk to you about today um, is that we use these phylogenies so that then we can ask questions about um, particular parts of, of uh, their ecology um, that we really need to understand relationships to be able to answer. So this is a phylogeny um, of insects that was made using transcriptomes. And I just wanted to show you this so I could orient you um, for those of us who uh, are interested in knowing where dragonflies kind of fit in the tree of life of insects. Um, so they're located here, um, which is makes them among the earliest um, branching lineages within the flying insects. Um, and they're sister to the mayflies, which are also flying insects. All of the flying insects are a group called the pterygoda. Um, and dragonflies and damselflies are great things to study, you know, in terms of their life history strategies. They were the first things to fly before birds, bats, and pterosaurs. It was insects, and it was probably something that was dragonfly-like. Um, they're aquatic. They, some of them are long-distance migrators. Um, they have global distributions. Their vision is kind of remarkable, and they do intercept um, predation. Um, and they're con generally considered to be very ancient taxa. Um, one of the things that people have focused a lot on for dragonflies and damselflies are their color. Um, they have different types of color, color patterns on their wings that males usually use to signal with other males um, for uh, in, in competition um, and for sexual selection. Um, and then there's also colors that are in their epithelial cells that can migrate kind of up and down to make them lighter or darker for thermodynamic regulation and also to um, allow them to be less visible to predators uh, in the habitat. We've kind of divided uh, odinates into three main groups. Um, there are the anisoptera or the dragonflies, and there's around 3,000 species of those. The zygoptera or the damselflies, and there's around 3,000 species of those. And then there's a third uh, suborder, which has just a single genus with four species found in China, the Himalayas, and Japan. So there's around the same number of species of dragonflies and damselflies as there are mammals, um, 6,400 species. Um, like I mentioned, they're aquatic, so their juvenile stages develop in fresh water. These are what the ju juvenile stages or nymphs look like. Um, and just as the adults are voracious predators, uh, the nymphs are also predators. They consume each other, as well as other aquatic insects like flies and things like that. But they also can take vertebrates um, in their juvenile stage. Often they will eat tadpoles um, and fish. So they really act as top predators in most of the systems that they're in. They have kind of remarkable reproductive behaviors. Uh, so all odonates um, have a uh, a, a peculiar system where males have uh, two penises. So they have a penis at the tip of their abdomen from which they um, ejaculate sperm into a secondary penis, which is at the base of their abdomen. This is kind of what it looks like in the lateral view. And this is what the secondary penis looks like. Um, they transfer sperm indirectly uh, via this secondary penis to a female. And what's unique about their behavior here is that um, males actually also use a secondary penis um, um, as a way to kind of control paternity. So females can mate multiple times and she has sperm storage organs in her body um, that are either long-term or short-term storage. Um, and she can select which sperm she uses for her eggs uh, to fertilize her eggs. And males have evolved these kind of cuticular expansions look like this on their on the secondary penis to do sperm displacement, the act of scraping out or displacing the previous male sperm in an attempt to try and ensure paternity, in an attempt to try and make sure that her, his sperm is that which a female uses um, when she's fertilizing her eggs. Um, this is what the bursa copulatrix, or the long-term storage, sperm storage organ and the spermatheca. This is what it looks like inside of the female anatomy. Um, this is what males and females look like in this, what's called a copulatory wheel when they're doing their mating behavior. Um, and when most of that is actually the sperm displacement behavior. So we know a little bit about um, kind of how the um, habitat choices have shaped um, 
<clears throat> the speciation rates that we see in dragonflies and damselflies. In general, when we think of odonates, we think of them as being kind of ubiquitous at water, uh, but different taxa kind of vary in their preference between lentic and lotic habitats. We can kind of classify which families in the dragonflies uh, prefer lotic habitats, which are colored in blue, um, or lentic habitats, which are colored in um, yellow. And this actually has some pretty significant um, influence on the morphology because the nymphs develop in these water systems and nymphs that are developing in, in lentic systems tend to have certain morphological adaptations um, that allow them to kind of be concealed by muck and, and sediment um, and detritus, um, and they actually have slightly modified behaviors for cleaning um, than what we find in taxa that are in low tick systems. There are some taxa that, that have, a, you know, some species that are in low tick and some species that are in lentic. Um, so it sort of varies. But when we look at this kind of across a phylogeny um, of dragonflies, what we see when we, we, we constructed a phylogeny of over 500 anisopter or dragonfly taxa, we see that there's actually shifts in diversification rate and speciation rate um, as we see shifts from low tick to lentic um, waters. So certainly it seems like habitat choice does have a strong impact on um, the speciation rate that we see kind of across the entire suborder of, of Anisopter with particular families having multiple shifts from low tick to lentic habitats. I haven't mentioned damselflies and that's kind of intentional because Zygoptera in general are kind of a mess. If there are people out there that are thinking, oh, I really don't wanna study mammals anymore. I'd like to study an insect group. Damselflies are a great group to study because we really, so much of their um, <clears throat> biology is, is really poorly studied. Um, we think maybe there's 50 families of Zygoptera, maybe there's 20, maybe there's 30. Um, most of the species discovery that's taking place um, is actually happening in, in damselflies. And so there's a lot of work left to be done and we haven't, we've only just starting to scratch the surface in understanding um, their, their biology. For dragonflies, it's a bit simpler. We've classified dragonflies as 10 families within the Anisoptera. Um, in general, we sort of know the relative relationships of these taxa. Um, we know a little bit more about the biology. They tend to be larger and, and more visible and more um, common for people um, to make observations about these around the water. But there still are some difficult nodes that we've had um, kind of a, a lack of understanding about. Uh, the superfamily Libelluloidea, uh, which are colored in blue here, which comprises several families, uh, the pedaleroidea or the pedal tails, which are colored in purple, and the gomfordia or club tails, which are colored in green. So the club tails are interesting because they are one of the most species rich groups within the, all of the odonates. So I mentioned there's you know, only 6,400 species of odonates, 3,000 of which are dragonflies. Well, about a third of those are libelluloids and a third of those are gomphids. So this is a really speciose group. What makes the two most speciose groups uh, similar um, the gomphoidea and the libelluloidea, is that they both have lost their egg laying apparatus or their ovipositor, and they squirt out their eggs in a clump like what's shown in this picture here. So the libelluloidea, which is also incredibly species rich, um, they also have lost their ovipositor and they just squirt out their eggs in a clump. So if you've ever gone out to see um, dragonflies, if you've been canoeing or fishing and you've ever seen dragonflies that have flown by you, it probably was a member of one of these two very, very species rich groups. So one of the questions we have about why these groups are perhaps so species rich, um, uh, one of the questions is what might be driving the speciation that we see in the gomphoidea and the libelluloidea. Um, an early hypothesis is that perhaps this unique kind of egg laying behavior or their strategy um, of just kind of squirting out their eggs in a clump, maybe that um, allowed them to kind of rapidly radiate. Um, this may have allowed them to have expanded larval niche space um, because females are able to take advantage of water that might be temporary or transient that may not be large enough to kind of support vegetation. All damselflies and other dragonflies, what they do is they have this egg laying apparatus called an ovipositor. And they actually cut a hole in plant material with this ovipositor, it's almost like a serrated knife. Um, and they deposit their eggs in one at a time. It restricts their clutch size because there's only like a finite space in the plant material. Um, and it also is very time consuming. 
Plus, like I mentioned, females need to find water that can support vegetation. And by contrast, these two groups that have the reduction in the ovipositor, um, they, can they tend to have larger clutch sizes because they're not restricted by the size of any kind of finite vegetation. Um, and females often um, are found uh, ovipositing in temporary or transient bodies of water. But to really understand whether this is a driver, we have to use a phylogeny. So this is an interesting question that right, phylogeny hopefully can help us answer. Um, this is what it looks like when females are doing this kind of ovipositing behavior where they're just tapping their abdomen on the water. This is a female that's got a, a, a clutch of eggs at the tip of her abdomen, and she's just kind of dropping them um, in batches um, onto the surface of the water, and then they'll sink down through the water column um, uh, where, they, where they will then hatch. So um, I, one suggestion that Camilla Koch made um, from Germany was that perhaps predation was one of the drivers that led to the reduction in the ovipositor. Certainly whenever dragonflies and damselflies are at fresh water, um, they're kind of constantly being taken by birds, fish, frogs, lizards. Um, and she argued that perhaps the speed with which females can lay their eggs, which you saw in that video, she can lay her eggs very quickly in this manner. Um, perhaps that may have been one of the drivers um, in the reduction in this, this ovipositor. So if Gomphidae and Libelloidea are recovered as sister taxa in a phylogeny, that would suggest most parsimoniously, um, the simplest explanation would be that there was a single reduction in the ovipositor um, that was shared in their common ancestor. But if Gomphids are cover recovered as sister to the petal tails, um, that would suggest that the reduction in the ovipositor occurred twice, once in this really speciose group, the Gomphidae, and once in the really speciose group, the Libelloidea. So we can use a phylogeny to kind of look at what the relative positions are of these taxa to try and answer this question. And this is a phylogeny that we reconstructed using close to 500 genes. And if we zoom in here, uh, what we find is that um, the pedaloroidea and the gomphoidea are recovered as sister taxa with really strong support. So what this means is that regardless of the different types of measurements of support that we, we, we find, um, uh, they all seem to, to strongly support this relationship, which means that the reduction in the ovipositor occurred twice. So gomphoidea lost their ovipositor and libelloidea lost their ovipositor. We can look at different types of data. This is a phylogeny using transcriptomes. This has close to 3000 genes, so even more genetic data. And we find the same result um, where pedaloroidea and gomphoidea are recovered as sister, which means the reduction in the ovipositor occurred twice. This switch to laying your eggs really fast and taking advantage of temporary or transient bodies of water seems to have occurred twice in the evolutionary history of dragonflies. Now that we know this, we can try and look at time, um, at the timing of this event. This is a phylogeny uh, that is a chronogram where we've actually dated the nodes of the phylogeny. And we find that the reduction in the ovipositor seems to have occurred during the time when we see the rise of modern birds. It doesn't mean necessarily that, that, that modern birds or the predation pressure by modern birds um, drove uh, the reduction in the ovipositor, but this is just one more piece of evidence towards this kind of longer term project to look and, at, our, at how and why um, we see this switch um, in egg laying behavior. Um, another aspect that seems to be really driving the, the diversity um, of odonates is their dispersal capabilities. Um, some dragonflies and damselflies travel no more than maybe 11 meters their entire life, and others might travel 11,000 kilometers in their life. And one example of a dragonfly that travels really long is Pantala, which is shown here in this photo. This is one of the, this is a dragonfly that travels 11,000 kilometers as a single individual. Um, this uh, dragonfly is called Pantella flavescens. It belongs to this genus Pantella that only has another species. Um, there's only two species in this genus. Um, the other species goes from Canada to Argentina, but Pantella flavescens is global and cosmopolitan and what we consider to be a long distance migrant. It has some of the characteristics that you might expect of a long distance migrant. Um, females take advantage of Temp of temporary waters, of transient bodies of water that form after rains. Um, and as such, um, the nymphs actually develop very quickly uh, in five to six weeks. 
which is in contrast to other dragonflies, which might take a year or up to five years to develop as a nymph before emerging as an adult. So they have very rapid development. They have modifications to their morphology to expand the surface area of their wings for gliding style flight, like the anal vein regions, which I've colored here in red. And females largely disperse passively using the intertropical convergence zone by having hair sensors on the top of their wings, um, the dorsal glass side of their wings, uh, that once they're kind of triggered, uh, they have a reflex behavior to pick up their feet and be carried by wind um, kind of around the equator. Except that colleagues who studied them um, in Tonga, in Easter Island, in some small islands in the South Pacific found that they had modified behavior, uh, presumably to avoid being blown out to sea because salt water is, is death to these taxa. So we've looked at genetics uh, for this taxa. Um, we, this is a, 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 something called a haplotype network um, where each circle indicates a genetic pattern that's shared by individuals. Uh, the size of the circle indicates the number of individuals that share a particular genetic pattern. And these, um, these kind of look like pie charts where they're color coded by the number of individuals from the different countries that are shown here color coded in this map. Um, and what I mean to show you with this figure is that the majority of taxa, whether they were from Guyana or Texas or Australia or Indonesia, the majority of them share one main genetic pattern. Um, and this it doesn't seem to be um, a very clear biological signal um, between continents, between hemispheres. It seems like the majority of individuals are sharing genetic information. And when we do other types of tests for population genetics, we do see high levels of gene flow, which indicates that individuals are kind of moving around this global, um, in, in this one giant global panmictic population. We can look at the biochemistry of these dragonflies. Their wings develop while they're in fresh water. As I mentioned, they develop as nymphs in fresh water. And so the hydrogen in their wings is incorporated from the H2O, the water that they're developing in as nymphs. And when they emerge as an adult, their wings, their chitin stays largely unchanged. So you can take the wings of a dragonfly off and combust them and capture the hydrogen and then measure the weight of it. Because it turns out the weight of hydrogen actually varies <clears throat> along a longitudinal and latitudinal gradient. So you can measure the weight of hydrogen if you catch a dragonfly in the middle of New York City, for example, and it will tell you whether or not that individual developed as a nymph in New York City or if it developed as a nymph in another continent. Um, and when we do this uh, for a variety of samples from the countries that I've indicated here, uh, we find that the majority of individuals are migrants, um, with a few exceptions from the Andes that seem to have kind of like a local or resident signature. So in general, in terms of what we know about the kind of ecological patterns or an evolutionary patterns of odonates, um, it's kind of one of these where you throw up your hands. There's still so many unknowns. Uh, we really don't know. There's a few examples like Pantala that we know an awful lot about as a migrant. But in general, for most odonate species, we have no idea what individual ranges are. We have no idea the size of populations. Um, we have no idea how far individuals disperse. Um, and we don't really understand how, how much variation there is among species in terms of female over position site preference um, and the cues that females might be using when they're laying their eggs. Uh, we don't really understand very much about the egg laying procedure. Um, we don't really understand how much variation there is among clutch sizes. So there's really like, um, I would argue, uh, many lifetimes of work left to be done um, for odonates. So there's a lot of work to be done and hopefully people will, um, will give up their life's work and, and become odonatologists. Um, to try and answer some of these questions. As we know, insects are in decline, and it's very hard to, when people ask, oh, what do you think about dragonflies? Are dragonflies in decline? It's very difficult to answer that question because so many of these very basic um, kind of principles about their biology are, remain uh, a big question mark. Um, I have just a couple of minutes left and I wanted to take a moment just to let people know about a collective that colleagues and I um, developed called Entomologists of Color. I wanted to mention this to you because this is a group that we formed uh, to uh, try and diversify the field of entomology more broadly. Um, although the, you know, many of us who are part of this group are ecologists or evolutionary biologists. We work on recruitment, retention, and advocacy. And um, I just wanted to mention that we are giving away free memberships to entomological societies around the world uh, to students of color. Um, there's a website uh, that is found here uh, with 
forms that you can fill out to sign up for up to three memberships per student. Um, so please feel free to share with your students if of interest. Um, these are of some photos of my kids when they were younger. Um, they're teenagers now, and they really enjoyed uh, the natural world and being curious and insects. And, and our goal is to try and kind of keep the curiosity alive. And as I mentioned, there's still so much work left to be done um, to really get basic understanding about uh, the ecology and evolution of dragonflies. So we need more people <laughs> and we need you to, to join us, please. Um, and with that, I'll uh, thank my, my uh, collaborators and funders, um, as well as the folks in my lab. And if there's time, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. This is really fascinating. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm mind blown. Uh, so much things uh, that you presented that are really cool. Uh, while people are starting to ask questions in Slack, I'm gonna take the advantage of being a chair and ask the first question. Uh, do you know if there is, a, you know, exploitable fossil data for these groups? Like, can you have like fossilized ovipositors or something like that to look at these behaviors through time? That's such a good question. We have a great fossil, I mean, odonates are considered to have a great fossil record, but that's because the wing venation patterns um, make really good compression fossils. Um, but the abdomen, which is largely soft bodied, uh, is, is often lost. And for the individuals that have lost the ovipositor, so the ovipositor is a structure that is actually made up of three different structures, the gonopophyses, which are sclerotized, and they fit together almost like a slide. Um, but when they're lost, it's just fleshy tissue. So uh, it, it, even, even less likely to, to, to be present in a compression fossil. We do have some nice amber fossils. In fact, we have a nice one from um, Mexican amber that actually has some libelluloids ovipositing. So females without an ovipositor squirting out a clump of eggs is, trapped forever in amber, um, but that's a really young fossil. So it's that doesn't necessarily help us in terms of understanding what was happening during the Cretaceous. Um, so as far as I know, we don't really have any, any compression fossils that, that have an intact ovipositor that's visible, um, which is unfortunate. There are some examples of damselflies, uh, but all damselflies have um, a hard sclerotized ovipositor. So that doesn't really help us get a, get a clue for the, this, this question. Cool. Uh, I have another question from uh, Alex that asks, uh, what factors might drive increased diversification rates in lentic system relative to lotic? Well, I think that when, ever, I mean, so there are some, like I mentioned, some variation uh, that we see in morphology um, as they switch from lentic to lotic habitats that tend to lead to kind of um, uh, kind of a bit of a shift in a, in a bunch of other downstream traits. Um, so whenever there's a switch in this kind of, it's a pretty dramatic shift in the larval habitat. Um, I think it kind of frees, uh, you know, uh, individuals to kind of go on a different evolutionary trajectory. Um, many of the individuals that switch to Atlantic habitat do some form of concealment. And indeed, the majority of lentic taxa, although not all, are in these really species rich groups that I mentioned, the Gomphoidea and the Libelluloidea. Um, and so they also, if they're in water that doesn't have a lot of vegetation for them to kind of cling and, and hide behind, then they do some type of larval concealment with modifications on their tarsi that allow them to kind of cover themselves, which also leads them to have modifications in their eyes so that their eyes can peek out of the, the concealment. So there's all these other traits that change. And I think that also, kind of is, is what we're seeing when we look at this, this species um, uptick. But certainly um, the most uh, species are in these two groups and those groups are um, primarily uh, lentic, although they, they have some examples of, of low tech taxa in each of those super families as well. That's really cool. Uh, another question from Victor. Uh, they're asking, have any species adapted to salt water for their larvae? Seems like a huge niche to colonize. Yeah, I mean, they've had, you know, what we think is at least 250 million years <laughs> to, to try this out, but they really haven't, Victor. There's a single um, taxon that I know of, Erythrodiblax bernice, which can tolerate um, kind of um, uh, slightly salty water in like an estuarian system. Um, but that's really the only one. They're very sensitive uh, to salt water and it is in large part death um, to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Uh, then we have another question for Natalie, also a comment. Uh, uh, and Natalie asks whether you can share the entomologist of color link uh, uh, on here so we can share it as well. Uh, but also she was asking a similar question to mine, uh, whether you are interested in adding fossils info in uh, this work. Yeah, I mean, we have been really, uh, we have tried to incorporate fossils in our understanding of time. Um, and what we know is that there's certain, so wing venation in dragonflies is something that's really obvious, right? People have used it for decoration. People have used it for morphology for a long time. Um, doesn't work great for morphology, to be honest, because the wing venation patterns are correlated with flight. More dense wing venation tends to impart a stiffer wing. Sparser ven venation tends to impart a more flexible wing. So depending on styles of flight, they may have denser venation or sparser venation or particular vein patterns are kind of correlated with particular styles of flight. But that's actually great because we use, we actually developed this kind of automatic um, an AI technology that does automatic feature extraction. Um, so we can extract a lot more information from wing veins, um, wing vein patterns, and also wing shape. Um, and what we what we find is that there are distinct differences between what we call flyers, you know, individuals that spend the majority of their time flying, um, like long distance migrators, um, although they don't have to be long distance migrators, and things that are perchers that spend a majority of their time kind of often with territories, kind of perching around the water, looking for mates and not really traveling very, very far or for spending a lot of time on their wings. We see differences that are statistically significant. So now we can look at fossil wings and we can see where they fit in this morpho space. Um, and that might help us make some um, estimates on how some of these flat fossils may have flown. Um, we tend to think of ancient dragonflies as kind of proto odonates that flew in the Carboniferous as being very poor flyers. Uh, they basically just had paddles to kind of paddle through viscous air. But by the time it was the Jurassic, we see a lot of modifications to the wing vein morphology in the fossil record of, of odonates. Um, and so it'll be really neat to kind of test where those odonates fall in this kind of space of this morpho space that we know is kind of partitioned by these, these different styles of flight. So that's actually a product we're working on this summer with some undergraduates in our lab. So, so stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, sounds like there's a lot of yeah, geomorph for behavior or functional analysis uh, that can be known about it. Uh, that's awesome. We're gonna look uh, on Slack if there is a uh, the question. Oh, there is a question from Keith that just popped out. Uh, just a question that crossed my mind for the dragonfly that have adapted fast of a position. Is there any knowledge of uh, on if the size of egg clutches have been affected by this? I imagine the adaptation of the reduced ovipositor and swift oviposition means the eggs and clutch size may have been modified as a result. Absolutely, Keith. So what we know, and again, we don't know this for all taxa, but to paint with a very broad brush, to generalize, the ones that have lost their ovipositor tend to have larger clutch sizes than the ones that still use an ovipositor. We think it's because the ones that are using an ovipositor are putting it in plant material, like in the in the re, in reeds or in the stalks of grasses that are emergent from the water. So there's only like a finite space that they can fit those eggs in. And by contrast, the ones that are just dispersing it, they tend to they they don't have that kind of restriction, so they tend to have larger clutch sizes. But we really don't know how much variation there is among individuals within a species and we don't really know how much variation there is kind of among species we don't know how much variation there is kind of within a season um females are making some choices but we don't really understand how she's making choices um we know that for the gomfordia which is one of those really species rich groups females also secrete a jelly and it's a very heavy jelly that weighs the eggs down to the bottom of the water column um and so i think that probably also plays in somewhat to the size of the clutch that they have um, because she's also putting that uh, the energy into making that jelly. Um, the Libelluloidea largely don't make a jelly. Um, so the eggs are just single individual ones that just kind of uh, are largely, I think most of them are eaten to be honest, but um, you know, over, I, how many of them actually make it, um, the success rate, we also still don't really know. Um, so there's a lot, of, yeah, a lot of questions about eggs. I didn't mention this and this is unrelated to your question, Keith, but also some dragonfly eggs when they're laid are bright pink, some are blue, some are black some are purple and then some are green. And then as soon as they hit the water, they just become tan and they and they lose the color. And what the function is of the color, we don't know. Cool, well, so. Oh. 
just said thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Keith. Thank you. Uh, great. So uh, I think like maybe people will continue asking questions through Slack. Uh, for keeping with time, I'm gonna uh, we're gonna end it up here. Uh, but thank you very much. It was really cool talk. Uh, thank, thank you, you also so much very much me. to all the other speakers for volunteering. Uh, and I think uh, Natalie is going to wrap up things uh, if you folks want to stick around. And yeah, great job, everyone. I'll be very quick. That was awesome, Jessica. Thank you so much. I love those dragonflies. It's so cool.